Chapter 8 The Bridegroom Tarried Quote, I, the Lord, will to retain a stronghold in the land of Zion for the space of five years. End of quote. Having discussed in Chapter 1 numerous passages of Scripture in the Book of Mormon, D&C, and other Old and New Testaments foretelling the apostasy of the Latter-day Restored Church, along with all of the other churches that claim to be Christian, we will now review two more remarkable evidences of the Latter-day apostasy from the New Testament from New Testament Christianity. One is a prophetic parable given by Christ, the other an imagery-based prophecy from the book of Revelation foretold by John the Beloved. If the Latter-day restoration of the gospel through Joseph Smith is true, certainly the New Testament would have made reference to it. It's my contention that the New Testament, and even Christ personally, did make reference to the Latter-day Saint restoration multiple times. We've already highlighted Christ's declaration of the three watches, which prophetically proves the veracity of the LDS restoration movement. We will now break down some of the events of LDS church history to show that it has fulfilled the first part of the parable of the ten virgins given by Christ and provides prophetic details about the fulfillment of the final part. The Parable of the Ten Virgins Shortly after the Saints of the Restored Church in New York relocated in Kirtland, Ohio, where they were to receive the law and be endowed with power from on high, it was revealed that Zion was to be established in the Jackson County area. In June of 1831, the Melchizedek Priesthood was revealed for the first time among the Saints of the Restored Church, and 23 priesthood brethren were ordained as high priest at a special conference. The Melchizedek Priesthood was necessary in establishing Zion. Shortly hereafter, most of the newly ordained high priests were to participate in a missionary journey to the land of Missouri, where another branch of the church was to be set up in preparation for the redemption of Zion. This ultimately led to the creation of a church in Missouri, led by a high council of high priests, as well as the church in Kirtland, which was led by Joseph Smith and a council of high priests. Unfortunately, because of irreconcilable conflicts with the inhabitants of Jackson County, the Jackson County Saints were forced to leave in November of 1833, within approximately two years of getting established there. Naturally, this created great anxiety on the part of the Saints, who had been commanded to gather there and were promised that the area of the United States would be the land of their inheritance. On August 16, 1834, Joseph Smith, the president of the whole church, residing in the Kirtland branch of the church, wrote a letter to Lyman White and others of the Brethren to the High Council in Missouri, who had fled from Jackson County. In the letter he told them that the Spirit had informed him that the leaders of the church in Zion must, quote, use every effort to prevail on the brackets, scattered, end of bracket, churches, to gather to those regions and situate themselves to be in readiness to move into Jackson County in two years from the 11th of September next, which is the appointed time for the redemption of Zion, end of quote. Giving a set time by which the redemption of Zion was to take place was quite a bold thing to do. Critics of the Latter-day Saints often refer to these statements made in this letter to demonstrate that Joseph Smith was a false prophet, since the redemption of Zion failed to take place by the appointed time. If one reads the entire letter and puts his statements in context, it's clear that Joseph Smith was not prophesying that Zion would be redeemed on that date, but rather he was giving a conditional promise from the Lord based on obedience. The date of the appointed time was predicated upon the faithfulness of the saints. If the saints were faithful in exerting themselves, the redemption of the saints would be accomplished on or before September 11th of 1836. On the other hand, if they failed in this attempt, they would be scourged. In the same letter, he warned them, quote, If we don't exert ourselves to the utmost in gathering up the strength of the Lord's house, that this thing may be accomplished, behold, there remaineth a scourge. End of quote. Church historians and gospel scholars generally have very little to say about Joseph Smith's declaration. For this reason, many Latter-day Saints are unfamiliar with this quote. If we really believe that Joseph Smith was acting under the influence of the Spirit, and that God really had designated the appointed time and place for the redemption of Zion, it seems likely that prophets from previous dispensations would have uttered prophetic statements about it. I would submit to you, that Old Testament prophets did make reference to this event in the LDS Restoration Movement, and, in fact, 
Christ himself offered a parable that would profile the restored Church of God in the latter days. The remarkable thing about the appointed time of September 11, 1836, for the redemption of Zion, is that while it is used as anti-Mormon literature to discredit Joseph Smith and the LDS Restoration Movement, it actually provides one of the most compelling prophetic arguments for identifying the restored Church of Christ in the latter days, in fulfillment of the parable of the Ten Virgins. I would argue that Joseph Smith was acting prophetically when identifying the appointed time and place for the redemption of Zion. During that generation in the second watch, nevertheless it was foreknown by Christ that the appointed meeting would not take place. If, indeed, this hypothesis is true, his statement and the related events of LDS Church history have huge implications, and they would actually identify the literal fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins and explain why the bridegroom tarried, providing a powerful historical witness that the Church of Christ, as restored to the, church, the earth by Joseph Smith, was indeed the true Church of Christ. It would identify the saints of the LDS Restoration Movement as the virgins who fell asleep on their way to meet the bridegroom. Prophetic utterances in Isaiah appear to have been referring to the Kirtland saints and the passing of the appointed time of redemption of Zion. Quote, When I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. I also will choose their delusions, and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. End of quote. As we have discussed earlier, virtually all prophecies have at least a dual fulfillment, and sometimes more. Modern Revelation reiterates the words of Isaiah and informs us they refer to at least two specific and separate events in religious history that take place prior to the second coming. Notice the response of the Lord in the above scripture from Isaiah and compare it to the following scripture in the DNC. Does this not apply to the unfaithful saints in all three watches? Quote, in that day when I came into mine own, bracket the first watch and a bracket no man among you received me and you were driven out when i called again there was none of you to answer yet my arm was not shortened at all that i could not redeem neither my power to deliver and this shall ye have of my hand ye shall lie down in sorrow behold and lo there are none to deliver you for ye obeyed not my voice when i called to you out of the heavens ye believed not my servants and when they were sent unto you, you received them not. End of quote. Isaiah also speaks of an unsuccessful attempt in harvesting fruit in his vineyard. Quote, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? End of quote. Again, Latter-day Revelation provides clarification to the words of Isaiah by explaining the parable of the wheat and the tares. The redemption of Zion at the time of the foundation was being laid in Kirtland and Jackson needed to be delayed because wild grapes, tares, were among the natural grapes, wheat. Quote, but behold, in the last days, even now, while the Lord is beginning to bring forth the word, and the blade is springing up and is yet tender, behold, verily I say unto you, the angels are crying unto the Lord day and night, who are ready and waiting to be sent forth to reap down the fields. But the Lord saith unto them, Pluck not up the tares while the blade is yet tender, for verily your faith is weak, lest you would destroy the wheat also. Therefore, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest is fully ripe. Then you shall first gather out the wheat from among the tares, and after the gathering of the wheat, behold and lo, the tares are bound in bundles, and the field remaineth to be burned. End of quote. The prophetic date that Joseph Smith gave for the redemption of Zion in his letter to Lyman White had previously been revealed three years earlier. It's contained in a revelation known as Section 64, which was also given on September 11, 1831. Quote, I, the Lord, will to retain a stronghold in the land of Kirtland for the space of five years, in the which I will not overthrow the wicked, that thereby I may save some, and after that day, I, the Lord, will not hold any guilty that shall go with an open heart up to the land of Zion. For I, the Lord, require the hearts of the children of men. End of quote. And that's in section 64.
We see from section 64 that three years prior to the letter Joseph Smith wrote to the brethren in Zion, the Lord had revealed that Kirtland would no longer remain a stronghold for the members of the church after September 11th of 1836. Section 64 is an amazing prophecy. Little did the saints realize that after the designated five-year period of time, the attempt to redeem Zion would have failed and that the temple would be defiled. Following that, the ill-conceived Kirtland Safety Society would be concocted. Eventually, it would fail. The disenchanted saints from within the church would dissent, causing great contention within the church. This conflict causes the leadership of the church and most of the non-dissenters to flee from Kirtland. Needless to say, the redemption of Zion never materialized on or prior to September 11, 1836. A feeble attempt at restoring the saints to their lands in Jackson County had taken place in the form of Zion's camp in 1832, but it failed in its mission. The saints ultimately failed to find their redemption at the appointed time in Jackson County, several years after the Zion's camp episode. The hopes of the saints were dashed. The appointed time came and went, and Zion was not redeemed. One could postulate that the scourging pronounced upon the saints in the letter and the other revelations took place in the form of the persecutions they experienced as they were driven by their enemies from Kirtland, Far West, and Nauvoo. September 11, 1836 appears in some ways to have been the middle apex of the Restoration Movement. The beginning of the first seven years was heralded in the Restoration of patriarchal priesthood offices through John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John. It also contained the formal establishment of the restored Church of Christ. The end of the second seven-year period of time brings us to Joseph's martyrdom during the Nauvoo era. However, just a few years prior to that, Joseph resigned as the prophet of the Church, declaring his brother Hiram to be the sole prophet. His resignation fulfilled the succession prophecy in section 43, proving that Joseph was no longer, quote, abiding in the Lord, end of quote. September 11th had already been and would continue to be a notorious date in history. Just months before the appointed time of September 11th, 1836, the Savior appeared to Joseph and Oliver to accept the temple. A strong case can be made for the possibility that the failure of the saints to live the law of Zion and redeem Zion by the appointed time was one of the major things that resulted in the closing of the heavens. The prophet Isaiah notes that the wickedness of the Latter-day Saints in closing their eyes and rejecting the words of the prophets results in the covering of the eyes of the seers. Quote, for behold, the Lord had poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. For behold, ye have closed your eyes and ye have rejected the prophets and your rulers, and the seers hath he covered because of your iniquity. End of quote. It's an amazing concept that when God's people reject God's prophets, God will cover the eyes of the prophet, and sometimes even use that prophet to lead the people into further delusion. The heavens were closing. Prior to September 11, 1836, over 100 revelations were received and became canonized. Following that date, however, there were only about 10. The few that were received during the last half of his ministry contained ominous pronouncements. Section 112 declared the whole had been overcome by gross darkness and all flesh had become corrupt. Section 113 provided interpretations for passages of scripture in Isaiah 11. They contained the hopeful news that at some time in the future, God's people would, quote, put on the authority of the priesthood and, quote, return to the power which she had lost, end of quote. Indeed they, indeed, they would, quote, return to the Lord from whence they had fallen, end of quote. That bit of happy news had some pretty dark insinuations for the state of the church and the saints at that time. That revelation would be followed by section 124, which confirmed that the higher priesthood had been lost by the saints of that generation. It promised the saints that they would not be moved out of Nauvoo if they would repent and be obedient to God's commandments. Sadly, the saints of that generation were swiftly moved out of their place. Interestingly, no significant major revelations were received by Joseph Smith during the last three years of his life. Even his brother Hiram, whom the Lord had initially called to be co-president of the church and eventually his successor, did not receive any canonized revelation during those years, those last years.
the literal interpretation of the parable of the ten virgins would appear to be a prophecy about a group of believers who receive an invitation from Christ to come unto him at a marriage supper. Although the parable begins partway through the storyline with the virgins going forth to the marriage supper, it is obvious that an invitation had previously been extended to the saints, who in the parable are depicted as ten virgins. A wedding invitation must have an appointed place and an appointed time in order for all guests to congregate together at the same time for the marriage feast and ceremony. The parable informs us, however, that the bridegroom tarried and did not show up at the appointed time. Sometime after the appointed time, all of the virgins fell asleep without realizing the blessings of the reunion with Christ on this earth. Although some might postulate that the falling asleep of the ten virgins represented spiritual digression or apostasy from the truth, another scriptural case can be made that sleep in this context represents death. I would suggest that both are applicable. A strong biblical euphemism for death is sleep. In Matthew, we are told that the, quote, graves are were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, end of quote. Paul explains that many had died for taking the Passover unworthily. Quote, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. End of quote. He uses this euphemism similarly in Acts. Quote, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, was laid unto his father, and saw corruption. End of quote. In Corinthians, he states, quote, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Latter-day Revelation supports the biblical references above. Quote, but before the arm of the Lord shall fall, and angels shall sound his trump, and the saints that have slept shall come forth to meet me in the cloud. End of quote. And also, quote, They who have slept in their graves shall come forth, for their grave shall be opened, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. End of quote. And lastly, quote, I saw Father Adam and Abraham, and my father and my mother, my brother Alvin, and has long that has long since slept. End of quote. It's not uncommon for prophetic scriptural words to have multiple layered meanings. There's a strong probability that both definitions of the term sleep applied in this parable. The virgins appear to have gone into a spiritual digression and eventually died without meeting with the bridegroom. Perhaps the most pertinent and compelling key in discerning that the primary meaning of sleep is death is provided in section 86, wherein keys to understanding the parable of the wheat and the tares are given by the Lord. Quote, the field was the world, and the apostles were the sowers of the seed. And after they have fallen asleep, the great persecutor of the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that maketh all nations to drink of her cup, in whose hearts the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign, behold, he soweth the tares, wherefore the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. End of quote. The cry is made by the Davidic servant. Some time after falling asleep, however, the parable tells us a cry was made which raised the sleeping virgins from the dead. This is consistent with Davidic servant texts, wherein God's last witness, who holds the keys of the kingdom, returns to the vineyard to prepare the way of the Lord. He makes the loud cry and awakens the sleeping virgins from the sleep of death and apostasy. The mysterious resurrection of the sleeping virgins, which takes place just prior to the second coming, is spoken of in many places in the Old and New Testaments. One account is found in Daniel. Quote, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. End of quote. Perhaps one of the most vivid accounts of people awaking from death, when the last watchman lifts his voice upon the mountains, is contained in Isaiah 52. Quote, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion, shake thyself from the dust, arise, and sit down. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. End of quote. This chapter speaks about the Davidic servant with the marred visage and the other watchmen 
who publish good tidings and bring again Zion at the time that people are coming forth out of their graves. Another reference to the literal return from the dead of some of the sleeping virgins is found in Joseph Smith translation Matthew 24, which informs us that, quote, The Son of Man shall come, and he shall send his angels before him with the great sound of a trump, end of quote. If we were to search all of the Christian religions to see if there was a, mo a movement and religious history that fits the pattern and storyline of this parable, we would need to find a group that was striving to live biblical Christianity and literally claimed revelation from Christ inviting them to the marriage. Their prophet would need to have publicly announced an appointed place and time where the great marriage would take place. Furthermore, they, as a group, would need to have gone forth to meet Christ at the appointed time and place, and then failed in the attempt, causing the bridegroom to tarry. If such a religious movement could be found to fit that description, it would need to be a matter of public record that the bridegroom tarried and failed to come at the appointed time, leaving the saints of that generation lingering, and eventually passing away without realizing their dream of uniting with the bridegroom during mortality. I would submit that the Church of Christ that was restored to the earth by the prophet Joseph Smith is the only church on the face of the earth whose history and related prophecies coincide with and document the literal fulfillment of the first part of the parable of the ten virgins. Additionally, modern revelation documents the final fulfillment of the prophetic ten virgins storyline. He shall come in the first watch, in the second, and again in the third. As previously discussed in section 45, the Lord gave further clarity to the events of the last generation that are contained in Matthew 24. In that section, he revealed that greater information pertaining to the end times would be provided once the inspired translation was completed. Latter-day Saints have been given critical information pertaining to the second coming of Christ that no other Christian religion has. It is contained in the inspired version of the Bible. Sadly, the official version of the LDS Bible remains the King James Version, and few Latter-day Saints even realize the significance of the amazing content in the inspired version. In addition to the further clarity of Matthew 24, provided in the inspired version translation, other mysteries about the coming of Christ are also revealed. Let us now consider some of the secrets that the JST reveals about the end times. Here's an excerpt from the inspired version which gives additional information about the doctrine of the three watches that was addressed in chapter 4. It shows that the second watch is when the gospel is restored through the Gentiles and the Gentiles ultimately reject the gospel just as the Jews did. Finally, the third watch is the marvelous work when the Lord returns to reign in his vineyard. Quote, Behold, there was a certain householder who planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. And again he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. And Jesus said unto them, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those, unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will destroy those miserable wicked men, and will let out the vineyard unto other husbandmen, who shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doings, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Bracket, the Gentile church and kingdom will bring forth the same wicked fruits as the Jewish church and the kingdom brought forth. End of quote end of bracket, sorry. For whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. And they said among themselves, This man should think that he alone can spoil this great kingdom? 
and they were angry with him. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they learned that the multitude took him for a prophet. And now his disciples came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Marvel ye at the words of the parable which I spake unto them? Verily I say unto you, I am the stone, and those wicked ones reject me. I am the head of the corner. These Jews shall fall upon me, and shall be broken. And the kingdom of God shall be taken from them, bracket, the Jews, end of bracket, and shall be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, meaning the Gentiles. Wherefore, on whomsoever this stone shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. And when the Lord thereof of the vineyard cometh, he will destroy those miserable wicked men, and will let, bracket, during the second watch, the vineyard is leased to wicked rulers. They have the legal right to preside for a time, but are destroyed when the Lord returns in the third watch. End of bracket. Again, his vineyard unto other husbandmen, even in the last days, who shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And then understood they the parable which he spake unto them, that the Gentiles should be destroyed also when the Lord should descend out of heaven to reign in his vineyard, which is the earth and the inhabitants thereof. End of quote. Christ's coming during the first watch in the meridian of time was not recognized by the Jewish nation because they had inaccurate expectations and were not led by the spirit of prophecy. They were not found watching and waiting for the secret return of the Lord following the rejection of Christ by the Jews and the crucifixion. The gospel was taken to the Gentiles. Christ appeared in secret to his apostles and directed them in their ministry. It's easy to surmise that the second watch was fulfilled in the LDS restoration movement when the saints failed to meet the bridegroom at the appointed time. And yet, Christ came in secret to the Kirtland Temple with other ministering angels and ushered in a second dispensation without the world or even the collective membership of the saints knowing it. To this day, most Mormons are oblivious to the fact that the dispensation of the Gospel of Abraham represents the second watch prophesied by Christ. The third and final watch, or dispensation, is about to be ushered in. It's referred to as, quote, the dispensation of the fullness of times, and, or, quote, Isaiah refers to it as the marvelous work and a wonder. Uh, next time, I'm going to begin on Fall on Them Like a Stone, on part two of chapter eight. <laughs>